140 and 141 for tonight, Lord willing. I'm going to move through 140. Actually, I'm going to move through both of them pretty quick, but let me read the whole psalm, Psalm 140. <clears throat> to the chief musician, a psalm of David. David's going to write the next few psalms for us. And David writes, in a time of distress, and these things, although they're difficult to go through, we have all been there. You may be there right now. Your family, maybe the church can go through these things as well as the body of Christ. David writes, deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil evil things in their hearts they continually gather together for war they sharpen their tongues like a serpent the poison of asps is under their lips Selah keep me O Lord from the hands of the wicked preserve me from violent men who have purpose to make my steps stumble the proud have hidden a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. Selah. I said to the Lord, You are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God the Lord, the strength of my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further the wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Selah. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they may rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Wow, is that something? But I guarantee we've all been there in some form or fashion at one time or another. Maybe, as I said before, against, your bo uh, against the church body or against your own family or your own, uh, your own personal, you just brought to this place of great distress. And, of course, the question always comes about, you know, why would God allow something like this? Why did David go through so much suffering? Why do we go through so much suffering? Well, let me give you a couple of quick reasons here. On, uh, on Monday nights, we've been dealing with a group that's dealing with answers for atheists kind of a thing. But, look, we live in a fallen world. And, and if you don't think you're going to get hit by something in a fallen world, that, you know, that, that's not reality. Uh, not only are we living in a fallen world, but we're living in a world where people have free will. <laughs> oh my gosh, mix those two together. Fallen world, <laughs> people with free will, you're going to hit with something one way or another. But guess what? God can even accomplish good through these things. Because I'll bet you us sitting here tonight can talk about times in our lives where we were so distressed because our answers didn't work. We were so distressed because other people's answers didn't work. We were so distressed and despondent that we came to a place where we said, Oh God, oh God, and boom, God was there. It shows us our great need for God. Because I believe in this world there's only two kinds of people. Those who are desperate for God and those who don't know that they are desperate for God. So if God brings us to a place where we find that we're desperate for him, that is a blessing. <laughs> And Paul the Apostle then comes along, <clears throat> batting cleanup, so to speak, and says, whatever you suffer here, it's not even worthy to be compared to the glory that you will, be, will be revealed in you. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. You know, my latest thought has been, <clears throat> I think I shared this with Judy in the group last <laughs> Monday night. Okay, you ready for this? 
I, I know. I think I think these silly thoughts sometimes, but it got me excited. I can hardly wait. You ready? <laughs> to be young again. <laughs> huh? <laughs> How excited of a thought is that? You know. <laughs> sometimes you think, oh, I'm over the hill now. You know, <laughs> gotta get gotta get extra shots. You know, or this is it, or I'll never jump again. You know. <laughs> and then you go, wait a minute. Christ is coming back. We're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to be, have these brand new bodies, you know. Won't that be exciting? All right. Uh, I look at this, and I thought to myself, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, which says, Yes, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are you ready for that one? It's not a maybe, it's a for sure. You live godly, it's going to come. There is something that we must take as life in the big city for us Christians. And that is the world is hostile towards God. And if you're going to follow God, you're eventually going to be hit with some hostility based upon your faith. Now, that's not to say that we welcome it. Nobody welcomes hostility, do they? <clears throat> See, nobody's been hostile to me lately. This has really got me bummed out. But <laughs> it's just an understanding of the fact that it is a reality. Okay, let's, you ready to go to it? Let's go. Are you ready? Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> to the chief musician. So David's writing this to the orchestra leader. And he says to the orchestra leader, you know, it's the Psalm of David. And he starts out with, deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men. Now, we're not given the date of when David wrote this. And we don't know the, the peculiars of the circumstances. But I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, this is when uh, Saul was chasing David through the wilderness. In fact, both of these Psalms, 140 and 141, are David being chased. I don't know if you've ever felt like you were being chased in your life uh, by one trouble or another. <laughs> Cars breaking down and things like that. It's like a succession of things. When it rains, it pours. Is it seen that way sometimes? All right. So it says, Two who plan evil things in their hearts, they continually gather together for war. In the last few years in particular, there has been this kind of a movement, I would call it. Let's call it a ramping up. I think everybody's familiar with this. A ramping up of hostility towards Christians, towards faith, towards mocking God and mocking believers. Towards even in school, it seems like a little bit of rewriting of history regarding our uh, founding, the founding fathers. I think it's, What's the percentage of... Isn't the percentage of people who signed the Constitution, aren't they like 75% of them were pastors or something like that? <laughs> or, their, or their parents were pastors, you know? Uh, our, the founding of our nation is all about God. Up one side, down the other. Why do you think that there are scriptures over all of the monuments in, the, in Washington? It's because we were all about God and his plan for us. And so don't let anybody fake you out with anything other than that this growing hostility towards our faith in general and a real downplaying of it by the culture verse 3 they sharpen their tongues like a serpent the poison of asps is under their lips selah which means think about, it. <laughs> think about that for a moment would you david is just such a lovely writer isn't he I mean, that is so descript right there. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the tongue, doesn't it? And not much of it, not very good. <laughs> and so uh, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if there is somebody with a hostile tongue, it reveals that they have a dark heart. So the real thing that we need to do is not so much concentrate on what we say as to concentrate on the request of the Lord to purify our hearts. Because if you have a pure heart, I think I talked about this a few Sundays back. It's not so much that God wants you to do th good things. 
He wants you to be a good man or a good woman, right? And that's the difference between just trying to, uh, you know, tame the tongue, which is a very hard thing to do. You've heard from me and you've heard from others and you've heard from the very word of God itself that gossip is a really bad thing. Who knows gossip's a really bad thing? Gossip's a really bad thing. It is a horrible thing. It is downright evil. It's not from God. And we need to treat it as such. <clears throat> when I come across somebody who knows the 411, that's the information, on everybody, because <laughs> nobody dials 411 anymore, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. When I meet somebody who knows the Google on everybody, uh, uh, and uh, I do my best to stay away from them. That's pretty much the end of our relationship, you know what I mean? Um, wars have come out of gossip. How do you like that? Whole nations warring against each other based on gossip. Uh, careers have been ended based on gossip. Uh, reputations damaged on account of it. Churches have been damaged or churches have come to an end altogether based on gossip. I have seen folks turn on the very church that God used to bring them out of darkness. Tell me how foolish that is. One pastor that I like said the following, quote, If you find a gossiper, be assured to someone else they will be gossiping about you. <laughs> so avoid them like the plague, end quote. I really like that. Uh, tongues can do so much good. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues in the moment, but that can do good too. But your tongue can do so much good to encourage somebody, to lift them up. Uh, I was a little down the other day and somebody really encouraged me. And uh, they said, thank you for studying. Thank you for teaching. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, thanks. You know, just lifted me up. Like, those brothers that have the gift of encouragement, aren't they awesome? The brothers and sisters of the Lord, just they have a right word at the right time. God bless them. Um, verse 4. Keep me. <laughs> Keep me, O oh Lord. I can just stop right there. That's a whole sermon right there, isn't it? <laughs> Keep me, Lord. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's I, who, who's afraid that they're going to be the one person that wrecks the whole thing and <laughs> you know <laughs> it's going to come down to you and the Lord says you know what I was keeping everybody who came to me but <laughs> then there's you you know <laughs> because uh, that's how we feel sometimes but so David prays keep me O Lord from the hands of the wicked preserve me from violent men who have purpose to make my steps stumble the proud have hidden a snare for me uh, <clears throat> and cords they have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. Selah. I'll bet you the president right now. <laughs> I, I have never seen a more hostile, one-sided uh, press in all my life. I've never seen the press like this. You know, it's really they just they've sharpened their tongues, right? Uh, like, uh, so it's interesting if you wa if you watch, uh, I'll call it regular news. Yellow journalism was the term. <laughs> uh, and then you switch to a, a conservative station. It's almost like two different worlds, you know? You're just like, <laughs> this group here is saying how horrible. Then you go to this group, wow, how awesome. This is great, you know? Uh, approval rating is the highest it's been. In a long anyway, it's just really uh, surprising what's going on right now. All the people that are shocked that other people can have another opinion other than theirs. Anyway, don't get me started. Uh, David was greatly loved by some people, and he was greatly hated by others, wasn't he? Ah, Jesus was greatly loved by some people, and he was greatly hated by others. Oh, wait a minute. Whoever your favorite pastor is, Google him, and you'll find a group of people that just absolutely hate them. I don't care who it is. So if some people say it... In fact, uh, okay, so I was listening to this one pastor, and he was like, he's like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't stand all the bad press I'm getting lately, you know? And it was on a Wednesday night, he was talking to his group, and he goes, he goes, my wife came to me, and she shared with me all these things, these horrible things that people are saying about me and, and, and our church. 
And uh, and then she, he goes, so I read them. And then I looked at her, I go, why did you show me this? You know? <laughs> and so he actually read a couple of them, you know? And it was, uh, one of them was like, uh, at our church, we, at that church, they wife swap. And he's like, what? <laughs> and then he goes, at that church, uh, the pastor has made them into mindless robots. And he looked at it for a second, he goes, give me money. <laughs> he goes, oh, darn, it's not working, you know. So look, if, if there are detractors against you, you know, and I heard somebody it won't, not too long went on a rant about me, you know. Why, you know what that guy's teaching, and I'm not going to sit under his teaching. And I was like, really? Why did you tell me that? You know? <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Whoever you are, you're going to get it from one way or from one source or another and you might as well just let it go you know just let it go it's just gonna come it's horrible life goes on uh have you ever heard this saying before satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life <laughs> he absolutely does he's called the accuser of the brother brethren and he'll use anybody that he can to acu accuse you falsely it doesn't matter to him whether it's true or not. Like all these news reports that go out and then afterwards they find out they're false but, and there's no retraction, but it's just, uh, and that's brutal. That is, wow. So, uh, whew. in fact, these first five verses, don't they come across as having all the earmarks and characteristics of Satan? Yeah. They do, don't they? I mean, that is him to a T. Uh, verse 6, I said to the Lord, you are my God. Like we sang tonight, uh, I am yours. Uh, right? It's like, so, so was it you, Mike, who said, I don't think God got a very good deal? Or, <laughs> I am yours, you know, God doesn't brag about it. No, <laughs> we're all trophies of his grace. Amen. There's not one of us anywhere at any time who could ever stand on their own merit. So you might as well be just a lover of the grace of God <laughs> and thank God for in any way that he can use us for his glory. I said to the Lord, you're my God. Hear the voice of my supplication. Supplication, very strong, very personal, very intentional prayer. Supplication, O oh Lord. <clears throat> then check this out. Uh, this just caught me for some reason. I st still need to think about it for a little while. O oh God, the Lord. See that? Oh God, the Lord. I, I, David is the only one that uses this terminology in the scriptures. Oh God, the Lord. And the translation of it is, Oh Yahweh, God of covenant, right? You are my Adonai, which is a word that can be translated Lord, but it is Lord, uh, even somebody who's a president could be called an Adonai, or your boss at work could be called an Adonai, a lord. Or a slave to a master. The master could be called Adonai. But what this means is he's saying, O oh God of covenant, you're in charge of everything that I say and do. Now think of who's saying this. This is King David, the greatest king Israel ever had. Don't you love it how David, you can't find in the Psalms any place where David goes, yeah, that's me. <laughs> the slayer of Goliath. Here I am, and boy, aren't you lucky to have me. Ooh, David doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. Instead here, he so humbles himself, and he calls, he says, O God of covenant, you are my Adonai, like commander, you know. It's just, I, I just, it just touched me. I like this. Because I, I think this, sometimes in prayers you want to call on God, but then, you, but then it's not necessarily to establish or to speak on your relationship with him, but it's to get him to do something for you. See, and this is this is totally different. Has a totally different feel to it for me. It's I'm calling on God, but I'm understanding you're the God of Covenant, and I'm understanding that you are sovereign over every single thing I do. I can't make a move or step sideways without your permission and your guidance it's really really wonderful only david does that <clears throat> oh god the lord 
the strength of my salvation. Oh, this is good. Who's the strength of your salvation? Was it you? <laughs> okay, how many of you here think that you would make it to heaven if salvation was dependent upon your strength? And none of us, huh? So he really pins it exactly right. He says, Yahweh, my Adonai, the strength of my salvation, my total reliance and dependence upon him. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Wow, you know what picture I got? Uh, there was a, uh, okay, that's kind of silly maybe, but there was a Kung Fu movie came out some time back. It was called, I think it was called One or something like that. I, anyway, so at the end of the movie, he's there and and the whole kingdom's afraid of him. But so they line up all these archers and they shoot arrows into the, so there's just like a thousand arrows going, you know, that's what the enemy would like to do to you and me. But David says, in the day of battle, you cover my head. It's like God spreads an umbrella over us of protection and coverage. So our response to that is faith in believing that that's what God does, covers and protects us, and in thankfulness in knowing that he does this. So we're not to be in this place like, oh, I wish God could do that for me. Hey, is he your God or not? Is he the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Is he sovereign or not? In the day of battle, you protected me with this umbrella, God. Thup, 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 thup. <laughs> hey, I'm all right. All these arrows coming at me because that's what the enemy would like to do. <clears throat> and it also tells me this too. Uh, in the day of battle, you've covered my head. Okay, I'm going to go Jewish on you on this one. <laughs> yeah. uh, huh? I'm going to put a yarmulke on. <laughs> no, you know what the Jews do? They have, the men have a prayer shawl. So another way to look at this from a very Jewish perspective, in the day of battle, so in the day of battle, you're thinking the day of battle, what happens in the day of battle? Everybody suits up. So you hear the clanging of swords and the, you know, getting the shield ready and putting on the shoes and, you know, they're all ready to fight. In the day of battle, you have covered my head. That means David is going to prayer. David sees the value of prayer in the time of battle. And he's going to use it as his coverage. Isn't that sweet? Oh, I like that. Verse 8. Do not grant, O Lord. See again. Do not grant. Who is he talking to? Yahweh. Do not grant, God of covenant. I'm speaking of my relationship with God. Do not grant, God of covenant, the desire of the wicked. Do not further the wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Think about that, Selah. And let me tell you what. Verse 8 is a great prayer today, right now. Any one of us. You get up in the morning. You feel like the enemy's hassling you. Read this one. Read this verse out loud. Do not grant, O Lord, the desire of the wicked. Do not further the wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Verse 9. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. You know, Let that be their coverage. So over here we had the coverage of the Lord, coverage of prayer, right? But here, what's their coverage? The evil? The evil of their lips? Yeah, let that be their coverage. See how far you get with the Lord with that. Let burning coals fall upon them. Do you know who I thought about? I thought about, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I actually thought about Haman. Yeah, Haman got the old haymaker from the Lord. But Haman there wanted to hang Mordecai. Remember that? Esther's uncle. Uncle, <laughs> uncle Esther. Uncle Mordecai. <laughs> <laughs> Niece Esther. <laughs> but she was like a, he was like a dad to her. Right? And, uh, and so Haman got promoted. And uh, he used his promotion to try to destroy the nation of Israel. In particular, to building these gallows to hang Mordecai on. Uh, and uh, the Lord just flipped it. You know, isn't that awesome? So that's what I thought. What they're after, let that fall on them. 
Let them be cast into the fire, into the deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not the slander be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. That's just brilliant wording. <clears throat> but I have to tell you that I read this and because we know that David is a prophet, right? Yes? We know that David is a prophet. So I thought of the book of Revelation and I thought about the Antichrist. And I'm thinking that verse 9 through 13 speak of the Antichrist and his little demons that are running around. And David's saying, you know what? <laughs> Let this all backfire on them. Let them fall into the pit, which is exactly what will happen, the lake of fire. Let them rise not up again. And then notice this. This answers a question for me, I think. Verse 11, let not slander be established in the earth. Can you imagine an earth with no lies? That's amazing. I believe that will happen. I believe not only will you have a glorified body, I believe it will be impossible for you to break God's laws. I believe so complete will be the established work of salvation of Jesus Christ in each one of our lives that not only will the tears be wiped away but Jesus will be glorified in us completely I because sometimes you don't you worry I know that I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to be the one that thought the wrong thing at the wrong time you know I don't think that'll be possible I don't see that as being possible I see a total redemption uh, taking place and there won't be any slander established in the earth Okay, uh, let's go. Oh, oh you, want to know, you want to know what else I thought about verse 9? Because the New Covenant kind of changes things a little here, doesn't it? Yeah, right. And so David liked to do that. He, get them, get them, Lord, and, you know, help me, but destroy them. Well, we pray for our enemies now. In fact, I think God brings us to a place where we actually have pity on even those who would persecute us. And we think, oh my gosh, okay, go ahead, chop off my head. This will be over in a minute. And I'll have eternity with Christ. But you are facing a horrible, you know, future apart from Christ. So, like Stephen the martyr, exactly right. Yeah. He had the face of an angel. He gave him truth. Jesus stood up to greet him. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, verse 12. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted. We should have pity on the afflicted as well. <clears throat> and justice for the poor. The poor are near and dear God's heart. Believe me, they are near and dear God's heart. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're one of those people who, who has pity on the poor, and, you know, even if you offer just water, you're not quite sure if I want to give money or a blanket, or I've even seen some folks now that will leave uh, some nice clothes out. Have you seen that? Lately, some folks do that. They leave some nice clothes. You know, here's a nice jacket and a nice shirt. I'm just going to leave it right here if you want it. You know. So uh, that's near and dear the Lord's heart. Verse 13. And uh, plus, we, and we have a beautiful pantry here at the church that anybody who needs it can dig into that pantry. And anybody, anybody here who wants to take some of that and give it away on the streets. You're welcome to do that. You know, that's what it's for. Verse 13, surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. You like that? Amen. That's a good one. Okay, we can do this. We can do it. I know we can. I'm on this timeline. I want to get us through to Psalm 150 so we can have Mike teaching in about a month. Psalm 141, uh, this is kind of a, the theme of this is keep me safe. Anybody here want God to keep him safe? This is the psalm. Keep me safe. Uh, somebody else has called this psalm. I wish I had thought of this title. But somebody's called Psalm 141, the SOS psalm. Let me just walk us through it, okay? Uh, again, we don't know the particulars. Probably when David was running from Saul in the wilderness. Anybody tell me how old David was when he started running from Saul in the wilderness? Anybody can remember? When he first started running, yeah, we're talking. He was a teenager. He was probably eighteen. 
Maybe 19. 20 at the oldest, huh? How long did he run? 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years on the run from somebody trying to kill him. And you tell me you had a rough day, huh? <laughs> a song of David. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry to you. Okay, I. this is just me again. I, I kind of had a little smile on my face when I read that first verse. Okay, it is a desperate verse, and it's not funny. But the thought I had was funny, and the thought I had was, you know, I, I know you're not, you guys are nothing like me. So uh, when God lays something on my heart, you know, like to forgive somebody or to be kind to somebody or to love somebody that I think might be unlovable, <laughs> which it's nobody here. Uh, something like that. I usually take my sweet old time. I'm confessing to you. I don't, I don't operate as fast as I should, and I know that. But when it comes to God helping me, make haste, oh God. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I wish that I demanded of myself, right? The same as when I say, God, I need you right now, you know? So anyway, verse 2. Let my prayer be set before you as incense and the lifting up of my hands as in the evening sacrifice. Okay, uh, verse 2. Verse 2 accomplishes this. It tells us that David is speaking about how he knows he has access to God. That's almost like a question out of the way, huh? How do you know that you have access to God? How do you know you have access to God? Well, David gives two ways that he knows he has access to God. One is that his prayers are like incense in the temple. That's one way he knows that he can get before God. The second way is by the evening sacrifice. So he knows that he has a substitutional sacrifice access to God, as do each one of us. Why is that important? I heard J. Vernon McGee, this was a while back, but I could, you know, you can always hear his voice in your mind if you think about it for just my beloved, you know. And uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, you know, some people, they tell, they tell me that they pray all the time. But you know, my beloved, that God doesn't hear every prayer unless it is offered through Jesus Christ. Your prayers won't make it to heaven. The only prayer that God wants to hear from somebody who does not believe in Jesus Christ is, God forgive me of my sins on account of Christ. Isn't that something? So David knows that his prayers have access because one, they're offered by the high priest is the one who offers incense. How did the high priest offer incense? Oh, I'm taking you way back now. We're back in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> See, the Le book of Leviticus is profitable it is the word of god it is needed the church needs to know this he would go to the altar of incense at about seven foot by seven foot rack <laughs> that the animal sacrifices are offered on but he would get a little bucket and he would get a little spoon and he would go underneath where the sacrifices were offered and he'd pull some of those coals and he would stick them in here then he would take a prescribed uh only a prescribed and he could only use this particular uh ingredients for incense and he would go into the temple and he would walk up to the little altar of incense that sat in front of the curtain uh in front of the holy of holies and he would offer the incense and there would go the smoke of the incense and that represented the prayers of the saints and he would say prayers on behalf uh, uh, of the church, uh, of the congregation, the believers. So who's your high priest? <laughs> and what's he doing right now? <laughs> He's offering up prayers for us. Our great high priest right at this moment. Isn't that lovely? I need to be prayed for. Jesus is praying for you right now. 
So David says, I know because the incense of person. I also know because the lifting up of the hands at the evening sacrifice. And I thought about that, the lifting up of hands at the evening sacrifice. The lifting up of hands at the evening sacrifice. Your high priest also lifted up his hands, didn't he? On the cross. And that was your evening sacrifice once for all. And so David says, that's how I know I have access. Isn't that beautiful? That's how you know too. Verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. <laughs> okay, you know, you read that, you think of somebody who needs it, but you generally don't think of yourself. So what we should do is you should write your own name there next to verse 3. Because I've written your name next to verse 3. <laughs> Set a guard, <laughs> set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep a watch over the door of my lips. Please, God, do this. Don't think of anybody else until you first think of that verse belonging to you. Because so often we say things and then you, you can't pull them back, can you? Be nice if you had this little lasso that you could like, you do that. <laughs> I, I far, I'm far more likely Although sometimes we wish we could have said something, right? Every now and then. I'm far more likely to think of something that I said that I wish I didn't have rather than something that I wish I would have said, right? That how it goes. Okay, verse 4. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing. What a beautiful prayer that is. Because I know my heart. You know? Leave me alone for two seconds. You know? <laughs> and your heart will think of some dumb thing to do. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works. Look at this. With men who work iniquity. Careful who your friends are. Careful who you look up to. If you get together with somebody and you're always doing something dumb, maybe it's time to break that friendship off. huh? And do not let me eat of their delicacies. In other words, I don't want to run with people who do evil and I don't want any personal benefit from evil gains. That's the idea here. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the company of fools will suffer harm. Verse 5, Let the righteous strike me. What? And it shall be kindness. And let him rebuke me. It shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it, for still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Wow, isn't that something? Let the righteous strike me. Why in the world? And rebuke me. Why would he say that? Because the correction of the righteous, or we would call it accountability. How about that one? The accountability of the righteous is kindness, and it's an excellent oil. Proverbs 27, 4 through 6 says, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. That's a good one, huh? Verse 6. The judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff and they hear my words for they are sweet. Look, I really had to had to go over that one several times and look at different translations. So let me give you what I understand by that verse 6. This is saying when the judges are overthrown, those people who are against me, when the judges are overthrown, then folks will find these words of my prayer sweet. So my prayer is offered up in, oh God, please, you know, help me, protect me, you know. That doesn't sound so sweet. But then when God actually answers your prayer, it's like, oh, those were sweet words. Sweet words you pray to God heard and answered. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave as when one plows and breaks up the earth. Again, this is David imagery. and You got to kind of think the way David does imagery. He's not saying they're dead. <laughs> we're not dead. But look, with all that's come against us, we feel like we're people who have been 
thrown at the mouth of the grave. I mean, we're right there. We're just about dead, you know. We're taking our last breath right here, like those who are ready to fall or those who could die at any moment based on what's coming against us. Verse 8, but my eyes are upon you. Another word for but could be yet. Yet my eyes are upon you. So all these things are happening. We feel like we're at death's door. But this is a kind of <clears throat> no matter what statement. No matter what, my eyes are on the Lord. And then he does it again. See this? This is David. Oh God the Lord. See that? I, I think there's something deeper and more precious in that. And I wish I could pull it out. But just when I read it and I think about the context of David's life and that this is a desperate time, <coughs> you know, just the way that he says it and the way that it comes in, I, I know it's very precious. <coughs> oh, God, the Lord, in you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me or protect me from the snares they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Church, there are snares and there are traps and the enemy has set them for us. <coughs> and when I think of snares and traps, it's like this. The brother or sister who has come out of drugs and alcohol and then somebody hands them a beer at a Monday night football. And that is a snare as quickly as can be because they take a drink and then they're gone. You know, that's a trap and a snare. Or the brother or sister, <clears throat> I think we, we talked about this too. What could a 10 year old see these days? Anything, everything. <laughs> it's all available now, you know, anything. But somebody who's gotten trapped up in, say, pornography. They've been living righteous and living for the Lord. One snare, one trap, one look, and they fall right back into the whole ugly pit all over again. There are traps, guys. There are snares, and we're to be wise about it and ask the Lord to <clears throat> protect us. Verse 10. Let the wicked fall into their own nets. Amen while I escape safely. <laughs> That's a good ending, isn't it, for tonight? So, uh, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this night. I thank you for your love, your great love for us. I thank you for your forgiveness for us. I ask, Lord, that you would protect us from the plans and the schemes of the enemy. Don't let him have at us, Lord. Don't let him have victory. Shut him down, Lord God. Help us to be wise to see the snares that have been placed uh, for, our, for our benefit. Let them fall back on the enemy, Lord. I pray now, Lord God, this blessing over this church family of yours, Lord. Thank you, Father, for establishing us and protecting us. And I ask that your blessings would continue to flow over this church body. I thank you, Father, for the great number of saints that have come through our doors and have found salvation and a new life in you and i ask lord that that would only increase for i pray this in jesus wonderful name and all my dear brothers and sisters say Amen. Amen.